This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me is Richard Fields and John Cameron. And gentlemen, we're going to jump right in. A new Illinois law will now allow, allow students to take five mental health days starting in 2022. Oh, by the benevolence of the clown, our students and parents can now take care of their mental health as they see fit, but only for five days. Don't let it interfere with their blessed schedule and their blessed funding. Because we know they get funded by how many days you're in school. So God forbid you be out and miss a day of funding because, you know, you want to take care of your mental health. It just it goes to show the complete backwardsness of our relationship between school and parents and students. And they sit there, they can allow you now to have five mental health days. It's just it's absurd from the from the very concept. Well, I mean it goes to mandatory attendance at a public school. Or if by the uh, mercy of the crown, you're allowed to go to uh, private school or homeschool, uh, and that's very iffy whether you'll be allowed to do that. It depends upon your on your uh, family's uh, uh, well uh, w- wealth uh, if it's private school, and upon upon uh, some judgment from some bureaucrat somewhere if you're going to be if parents are going to be allowed to be homeschooled. It's the whole idea that uh, goes back to the to the German Bismarck. Uh, uh, education system, which was mandatory education to train everybody to be a good factory worker and a and a uh, obedient citizen. Uh, we have uh, an education system in this country, uh, El Hai at least, which is uh, designed for the uh, 18th or 19th century and is totally inadequate and totally uh, uh, back at, backwards for for the 21st, uh, 22nd whatever. It's, 22nd, 21st century, whatever century we're in. <laughs> whatever century we happen to be in now. Yeah. I, I want to I want to uh, say I I concur with uh, the whole and and every time we talk about government schools, I got to make sure I have this quote in front of me. Isabel uh, Peterson. There can be no greater stretch of arbitrary power than is required to seize children from their parents, teach them whatever the authorities decree they shall be taught and expropriate from the parents the funds to pay for the procedure. And I think a little bit later in the show, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the great teaching of uh, a local Sacramento area teacher and uh, the response to his his uh, teaching. But anyway, it's, uh, yeah, mental health. And they're talking about, you know, kids are under a lot of stress because of COVID. No, they're not under a lot of stress because of COVID. They're under a lot of stress because of the 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 uh, the overlords' um, methods to uh, keep these the serfs in place, which is the only possible uh, reason for masking kids and putting them in school. These are kids who are too young to know germ theory. They think they're going to die. They can't read facial expressions. They're isolated from their peers. No wonder they're stressed. And even if they weren't, um, what's the government doing telling people they can't take them out of a place where they they are brainwashed and taught no useful life skills and take care of their mental health? Well, as someone who had an undiagnosed anxiety disorder all the way through school, you can actually blame, you can excuse the 70s and 80s when we didn't know these things. But we now know these things, that anxiety disorder affects 19%, 20% of the population. And that we now know that early education produces long-term psychological harm. And we now know these things, but yet we get, what do we get from it? Oh, we'll allow you to take five mental health days. I managed to graduate high school on time with a 50% attendance rate. Wasn't, you know, how much, maybe I could have learned more if I had spent more time in school, except what I was learning in school was that I hated the place. <laughs> and so if we don't fundamentally change the environment of our education system, we're going to continue to have this problem. But as long as our politicians and the uh, unions that protect them are the ones in control, we're going to get these things like this where they allow us to take five mental health days, pat themselves on the back for being generous, and... You know, and students and parents are sitting there left in the lurch, holding the bag. And as you said, the this backlash over what would you call the Antifa teacher, but really it's a Marcus indoctrination in your school. He literally admitted it on camera. And 
what? And parents can go to their school board, they can yell and complain, but the school board wasn't even listening. They were sitting there on their phones, look, checking the internet. It was, it was kind of a... The complete lack of connection between parents, students, and the school boards, and those people who run our school system is just on full display these days. And it's, uh, it's almost disheartening. What do you guys think? Yeah. Are we talking about the anti? Or do we blend this into the anti? -fog? Yes, I did, John. Yeah, why not? <laughs> so yeah, I uh, uh, a, a friend of uh, Richard Richard and I worked with a, a young woman who sent me the video, and I think I did. I forward it to you, Richard. I forwarded the video to you. I meant to. Um, that was taken by Project Veritas, and I'm sure it okay. was. Okay. It was cut and, and pasted, and, and I don't think the guy knew he was being recorded, but um, he, he has a Antifa flag in his classroom. He put stamps on people's papers for, like, good jobs at Mao, Mao Zedong and Stalin and, and all these people. He said uh, on camera he had 180 days to turn these people and these kids into revolutionaries, and... If people don't like it, then they should give up their outmoded thinking and get on board and blah, 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 blah. Expletive laced conversation with what he thought were, were like-minded parents. Now, many things stand out to me. One, 180 days. So what are we paying these guys this amount of money for if they're only teaching 180 days? Although maybe with the job they're doing, brainwashing kids into – serfs who can't get a job when they get out maybe we should cut their teaching time down to one day um and just pay them not to do the damage they're doing but it was it was pretty bad and then the school district the principal said i'm not aware of the stuff that uh, being in the classroom before this i have no recollection of uh you know good and well somewhere later in their little statement they put out they said we apologize for anyone who's been made uncomfortable over the last three years. So apparently this guy was doing this guy was doing this stuff, Marxist indoctrination, giving people extra credit, students. This is an AP class, advanced placement, which is supposed to ready you for college, um, for for doing research into Leninism and Marxism and and uh, you know all the rest of that. Well, well, to, be fair, to be fair, that's that's exactly what you need to succeed in college if you're pursuing a liberal arts degree anymore. Oh, yeah. You need, no. to, be, you need to be totally woke, and they're going to be, you know, well prepared for that. Well, well, I, which, of course, well, leads to the question of what's a, a, a liberal arts degree worth anymore, which is basically it's a negative worth. Yeah. So if, if, if I am woke, I'll get a job and be broke uh, unless you get into politics. And what, what is this woke stuff? Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, if, if Ayn Rand were, were alive today, this would kill her. Uh, I mean, it's just everything she predicted and more, uh, of, of, uh, you know, and, and at least in the past, the, the socialists had the, the, the common sense to hide their socialism behind environmentalism. Now they've just gone ahead and said, we're socialists. So what we want you, America, to do, where we're up until you know government became oppressive, uh, best standard of living, best health care, best roads, best educational system, best, 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 best in the world. Once we started taking socialism and shoving it into you know government bodies, everything has gone hill downhill. Since then, we want you to take the example of Venezuela, uh, that shining light in Cuba and Nazi Germany and the, the Soviet empire and China and all these other murderous regimes. And we want this here because it's worked so well other places. Let's go ahead and brainwash the kids. Which brings me to the, to the, you know, the philosophical realization, which is something that I've, I've kind of come up with in the last few uh, weeks, which is this. When, I, when, when a government is oppressive, it's really the people in the government who are being uh, repressive or oppressive. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, we see uh, examples of oppression from Marxists when they control governments. We see examples of oppression from uh, right-wingers uh, when they control governments. Think uh, Pinochet in Chile. Uh, think, uh, although 
I, I hate to use the example of uh, Hitler and uh, and uh, uh, Mussolini because they were also uh, socialists and not really right wingers. But right wingers anywhere are also oppressive. Mm -hmm. And when we look at trying to throw off oppressive rulers, we often say, "Okay, we need to get our those oppressors out of there and bring in our own oppressors mm -hmm. that will enforce our point of view rather than the people we don't like's point of view." The real goal should be to get rid of the power that government gives to oppressors. Without power, the oppressors have no leverage. Their footnotes in history, their laughing stock. Give them power, and they have the ability to destroy civilizations, which is happening as we watch. Yeah, there's an old there's an old saying, and I forget what it who said it. But a king, a crazy king with no power is just a crazy king. But a crazy king who has actual authority is very dangerous. And so that's kind of the difference. We have a bunch of crazy people running for office, a bunch of narcissists. But the problem is they have actual power. If they're just up there blowhards, being a bunch of blowhards, it's fine. Who cares? But they have actual impact in our daily lives. Mm. And, and it's this, uh, I don't know. I don't even know what to think about it. So I'm just going to go ahead and move on. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I, so, you know, you, you reach a point where you just, where you just get so frustrated. Yeah. yeah. Closing statement, if I can, on this. Yeah. When I ever have discussions with people about government and power, I ask them uh, how many gas chambers uh, Target has run or Apple has run. Uh, how many uh, invasions of foreign countries has uh, even Microsoft that I despise done? Uh, individual people are, are good. People uh, who, who assume positions of government power immediately uh, turn into, um, basically, if, if you strive to have a position that has that kind of power, you, you are by de definition, in almost all cases, a sociopath. There are some shining lights in, in we have a couple of great libertarian candidates running for governor, who are there to dismantle government and, and throw off the 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 yoke? Uh, but I, um, you know, there's a T-shirt and I can't mention the the brand name because I can't remember it. If I did, I probably would. And it said it says they can't arrest us all. The only way to throw off the yoke of these people is simply for everyone to refuse to do what they say they have the power to make us do, because. They only have the, the amount of power that we give them. And if everyone refuses to do these stupid things, all they can do is sit in their little rooms and cry. That, that's a good way to end that and to move on. Um, our U.S. generals, as they become go move to the private sector, get to go to uh, corporate boards, consulting fees, uh, speakers, they get to go all these businesses and get huge fees for speaking. So how independent are our generals actually are? Well, let's just put some numbers on it. There were uh, eight generals that served during our 20-year uh, war in Afghanistan. Uh, those eight generals have managed to get on 20 corporate boards, uh, all very well paying. David Petraeus, uh, the guy who pled guilty to providing classified materials to his mistress while he was general, uh, is a partner with KKR, one of, the, I think, the largest private equity firm in the country. Stanley McChrystal, uh, he got $1.3 million for being on the board of JetBlue, uh, a similar number for being on the board of Navistar. Navistar is the company which uh, uh, paid a $50 million uh, fine to get out from under the charge of uh, defrauding the Marines of $50 million in overcharge overcharges for armored vehicles in Iraq and Afghanistan. What we have here, what? 1.5 billion. The fine was 50 million. The overcharge was 1.5 billion. Yeah, exactly. What we have here is a, a, a very clear revolving door between uh, the military generals and the uh, defense, country, defense companies that uh, uh, make huge amounts of money supplying the generals with the tools of war. Uh, the same can be, the same thing can be said for the education uh, complex, where we have a revolving door between the Department of Education at the federal and at the state levels 
and uh, the uh, uh, the textbook suppliers and the uh, uh, the uh, the other uh, kinds of uh, the other uh, businesses that are involved in making education uh, so called supposedly possible. We have the same thing in the in the healthcare field where we have uh, quasi monopolies granted by the government to hospitals and uh, other uh, med and, and doctors and other uh, medical care practitioners, and they move it back and forth between uh, FDA and between uh, the uh, Department of Health, Education and Welfare, and so on, the CDC, move back and forth between positions of power in the government and uh, running uh, large pharmaceutical companies and other, uh, and other uh, perquisites of having been in power and having contacts. The, the problem is that we give way too much money and way too much power to government. We need to stop doing that. Is my uh, optimism about that happening high? Well, not right now, but eventually we run out of other people's and printed money, at which point the whole thing uh, comes to a, an inglorious end. What follows is anybody's guess. I want to add uh, to what Richard said. I absolutely agree. Uh, I'm a veteran and uh, went to ranger school, dropped out. I uh, was just just tired and too small because I didn't have the 20 pounds to lose that, that most people lose between 20 and 30 pounds in ranger school. I would have weighed like a negative number. Not not really, but I would ended up weighing less than 100 pounds. So, so at, at ranger school, they used to have this thing called peer rating. And West Point officers go, uh, a lot of them go uh, to ranger school. And so they get in and rate themselves at the top, one through whatever, 100 West Point officers, and then senior enlisted folks and non-West Point officers, and then enlisted people where I was. And it used to be that if you were in the bottom of the peer rankings, uh, you were called from the school. Example number two, that's a West Point Protective Association, the WPPA. It's very well known. Uh, and it happens. My father was a World War II vet, um, and uh, he tried to give a bad OER to a West Point graduate, which is an officer efficiency rating. I think that's what they called it then. And he was riffed soon after, which is he, he, they, they found out they had too many officers of his rank, so they made him a sergeant. So... Um, this, is, this has been part of the U.S. military. The, the, I'm not saying that, uh, that some of the military schools don't graduate good people, but the idea that in that hugely structured hierarchical environment, you can take uh, skills and transfer them to an entrepreneurial world is flat out wrong. The only reason you hire those people and have them on the board and on the staff and all the rest of that is it so that you can worm your way into defense contracts, as Richard said? Uh, they're, they're, uh, you, you show me a, a, uh, a West Point general that could figure out how to market a product, and, and I will, I was going to say I would shoot myself, but there might, be, there might be a unicorn out there somewhere. I mean, it's, it's just, it's ludicrous. It's, it's ludicrous. It's like asking somebody from state government who's risen through the ranks of backstabbing and politics and state government to come out and, and give advice to uh, a somebody who has to survive in a competitive environment. It's, it's ludicrous. Yeah, this, uh, this notion that you can, a general who's worked in the military their whole life can go into a corporate ward and actually give them some actual advice on how to function in the real world is, is, is as John said, it's ludicrous. But they do can actually help them navigate the bureaucracy, and that's exactly that's, what they're that's there for. What they do. That's exactly they're what they're there favors. for. Favors. They know who to bribe. Well, I, I can't really. I don't want to say that because that might be actionable. They. They, they, they know. They know who's campaign to contribute to. Yeah. That. Yeah. 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 They know who. They have the Rolodex, and they know who's more yeah. friendly to conversations. Is a is a good way to start yeah. it. But well, actually, talking about that, we're talking about corruption in government. Uh, more businesses have fled California this year than they did all of 2020. Businesses or headquarters, they're, they're fleeing the state, as well as other people, as well as their people. It's, and, and I think the numbers show that it's mostly small businesses. Small businesses, of course, are the, uh, the hugest, uh, the largest job creators and have been uh, forever. Uh, small business creates a heck of a lot more uh, small, uh, more jobs and more economic vitality than 
than large established businesses do because they're risk takers where large businesses are risk avoiders. Uh, so we are destroying the lifeblood of business, which is the lifeblood of the economy of California by overregulation uh, in the areas of uh, uh, safety and in the areas of uh, environmentalism and, and a host of other areas. Absolutely. And one of the major areas is, um, I, th I don't know if farming is still uh, number the number one economic engine in the state of California. Maybe it's two behind tech now, but it's, it's huge. Uh, the two biggest uh, farming areas in the world uh, are, are in the state of California. And they rely on something called water. Uh, water, uh, as my English uh, relatives would tell me to say it, or if you're from London, uh, so uh, the mismanagement of an abundant natural resource called water in the state of California and the misdirection of that resource away from uh, a great creator of jobs and capital, which is the agricultural industries and the logging industries, which they've already destroyed in California, and directing it to um, the care of uh, a fish, which probably isn't even native. Um, you know, it's frightening. The 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 the, uh, the the problem is is that the people in government um, firmly believe that that wealth isn't created. It's expropriated. It's taxed. It's printed. But they don't understand that wealth, real wealth, wealth that lasts generations, wealth that creates jobs is created and they have they were never taught this concept because none of the schools they ever attended ever taught it they weren't taught it in high school they weren't taught it in college and if there was a course they could take that taught it they chose not to and and the they will pay the piper uh, the one part of science they they refuse to acknowledge is the, the the historical science that no fiat currency has survived forever um, but or for even more than a few, a few generations, which is what we're seeing uh, with uh, the uh, with the the, uh, the world's exchange, uh, uh, the, the dollar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, And for me, it's not just economics. We're actually ripping apart our culture and societal fabric. This is our these are our societies. People are being ripped out of our out of our communities. These are people who help uh, little league teams and. The, all these various community organizations have now been ripped out and moved off to somebody else to help a, help another community, while these the hearts of our communities are are being stolen from us because politicians are have a narrow focus, shall we say? Trying to be I'm trying to be polite and nice today. I'm trying to have a positive attitude, and I'm our topics are not helping. Because <laughs> our next one is. Who picked those topics, James? Oh, the, you know, that's I try to do my job. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna hit the next one, and it's even worse. We're, we've got a few minutes left. Um, this new Texan abortion law has everybody up in arms, and from a libertarian perspective, we're like, if you all would just believe what you actually say, this, these solutions are easy. Mind your own business. You know, these are. Per Difficult personal decisions, but now we have politicians and activists getting themselves more and more involved in our healthcare decisions. Whether it's abortions or vaccinations, it's the same thing. Get the heck out of our bodies. Get the government and society out of our bodies. They have no place there. Do you guys have a thought? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea that you can prevent something that people want to do by government uh, edict has been false and always will be false. Uh, drug abuse got worse when it was made uh, more uh, criminalized by the, Nick, the Nixon administration and, and administrations before it. Uh, prostitution is the oldest uh, industry in the world. It's never gone away despite however uh, strict the prohibitions against, us, against it in any culture, anywhere. And the same thing is, is true uh, with the, the topic at hand. Absolutely. There are there are people who firmly believe, fervently believe that that uh, a, a fetus is a is a human life and is sacred and and uh, you know the motivation to doing the, these trying to trying to create these laws. Some of these people, I'm not saying all of them, is basically to prevent what they consider murder, and they're they're 
the motivations might be pure and clean, uh, but you know, the the uh, if it wasn't for the abortion subject, the the uh, regressives, as I like to call people who are labeled by others as progressives, would never win an election, not a national election. But because the conservatives uh, slash libertarians, some libertarians, conservative leaning libertarians, line up on the wrong side of it, they automatically lose majority of the women's vote in this country. And there are um, there are ways, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court, I think their decision was based upon the fact that legally Roe versus Wade was a very crap legal decision. And, you know, what they're what they're saying quite simply is, OK, Congress, if you um, if you want uh, something that will hold up to legal standard, uh, go ahead and write a law. Go ahead and get together as, as you know, the Senate and Congress and codify. Uh, people's rights to uh, at, at a national level, uh, something that's part of our constitution to have an abortion, um, and um, you know that. So the solution to to the problems and the fights about Roe v. Wade and all the rest of that is very simple. Um, and and um, well, if it, government does anything, it's not very simple. And there are also, you know, one of the one of the benefits of the the federal system is that, uh, you know, if you don't like the abortion law in in Texas, then uh, Mexico is right across the border. Uh, there are other states where you can where you can go. So uh, I'm not saying that that the decision was a good one, but I'm saying that there are workarounds. There's there are abortion pills or abortion treatments. The the go to for movie stars, you know years and years ago was simply a, a huge penicillin injection into one buttock uh, to cause a, a miscarriage. So um, it's government trying to control what other people want to do will always fail. And, you know, thank goodness uh, there's there's not enough people in government to actually point a gun at every single one of us every day to make these things stick. Yeah, there's... Competing moralities. Two things can actually be true at one time. You know, there, you can't actually have the right to be secure in your own person. And, you know, abortion can be viewed as morally wrong. And those two things can actually be true. And when those two things intersect, we have a difficult conversation. But we can't have difficult conversations if we're yelling at each other and accusing each other of being bad human beings. I, there are... Honorable people trying to do honorable things, but you have to remind yourselves that the path to hell is paved with good intention. Mm. And so as much as they may want to have good intentions on wanting to save the lives of unborn fetuses, those good intentions come with a cost, and those costs must be weighed. And we must weigh that we are out of time. We want to thank you guys for joining us. We want to thank Richard and John for being here with me. You can find us on all the various social media. and. From those of us on here, Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m. and the Libertarian Counterpoint show on Thursday at 8 p.m.